Red. At least, that's what it looked like. An ocean of red. Tossing and turning in the field behind my house. At the center of this red sea. A door. Void of any connecting architecture. Standing absolutely still despite the pandemonium unfolding around it. Every so often, the tides would climb the wood and submerge its shape completely. After each dip beneath the waves, it would resurface, closer than before, beckoning me to reach for it and reveal the secrets held within. Soon enough, it filled my field of view. And then, blackness. I always woke from this dream, panicked. Something about it shook me to my core. I didn't want to open the door, but it had this strange hold over me. An unseen force seemed to govern my will. Luckily, in these nightmares, I was never able to turn the knob, always an observer, taking a back seat to the scene itself. And oh, what a horrific scene it was. A feeling more than a view. An indescribable dread that only ever fully set in when I awoke. It was enough to render me stricken with fear on many restless nights. Last night was no exception. The dream came and went, just as it always did. I jumped to a sitting position and gathered my wits. In turning my head towards the bedroom window, I saw it, out in the clearing, halfway between the house and the forest edge. It was the door, the one from my dream, soaked in moonlight. I couldn't believe it. In an utterly broken state, I rubbed my eyes to make sure I wasn't seeing things. I pinched myself to know that I was awake. Indeed I was. The sight before me was a real one. Just as it had in my dreamscape, the dang thing called to me. A sickening call that resonated through every last bone in my body. I couldn't fight the insatiable curiosity that overtook me in this moment. It was enough to nudge a frightened child into the dark, or a feeble mouse to birds of prey. A pulse so strong, it made me need the door as much as I needed the air in my lungs. A terrible, wicked need. Unable to resist, I ventured out to the field and I stepped over it. My heart pounded so hard it echoed off of the door's wood. Contrary to these signals, I set my body to run. I stayed. Not only did I stay, but I reached for the knob. Luckily, my hand stopped mid-turn. Perhaps it was the adrenaline, or maybe the overwhelming fear that cascaded throughout my body. Either way, I was able to regain my movement and back away from the door. This small victory over the mysterious powers that befell me, however, would be short-lived. It was soft at first, like a creek rolling in the woods, but it grew louder and more powerful. A river, then a waterfall, and finally a dam bursting out into the world. A relentless energy devouring everything in its path. It was a familiar sound, one I knew very well. I turned and saw the blood from my dream. A tsunami of horrific proportions hung in the night air for a brief moment before crashing down to earth. It engulfed my home in seconds. I had no choice at this point. Just before I touched the land at my feet, I opened the door and I stepped inside, swiftly closing it shut behind me. I was now an animal caught in the trap of an unknown hunter. A hunter who would soon sink his talons into my flesh. With my hands still against the door, I craned my neck around to survey the area. What I saw was unexpected. It was a room, the kind you might see upon entering an office building. There is a desk with a receptionist tapping away at a keyboard and stairs leading up to the next floor. But the design, it was all white. 
Might have turned away at first, blinded by the brightness. When my eyes adjusted, I turned back and the receptionist took notice. Oh, hello there. Come please, I won't bite, I promise. I hesitantly stepped over to the front desk. She smiled. What is this place? I asked. She dodged the question. Sorry for the theatrics. It's the only way we can get people to open the door. The allure isn't enough, it seems. Human fear is the one thing we don't fully understand yet. More still working out the kinks, you see. I looked at her confused. I'm not completely sure what she was rambling on about. Oh, I almost forgot. You're expected upstairs in room 371. I'll take you there. Before I could object, she walked out from behind the desk and grabbed me by the arm, pulling me up the stairs with a vicious grip, smiling the whole way up. Don't look so troubled, dear. It will be over before you know it. A quick procedure. Then you can move on. Where are you taking me? What is this place? What the heck is going on here? She smiled again. You humans are always so inquisitive. Such a strange trait. Soon enough, we arrived at what I presume was room 371. A black door at the end of a long, white hall. The dissonance was unsettling. Here we are. The receptionist knocked twice at the door. An older gentleman opened it up to greet us. He was maybe in his 50s. Well-dressed, gray mustache. Ah, uh, yes, this must be our latest arrival. How are you? He asked. I want to go home right now, I demanded. The man and woman chuckled. It's so strange how they all tend to say that. Well, let's begin. The receptionist handed me to the gentleman and closed the door behind us. I was now in an equally black room. Small, maybe 12 meters by 12 meters with a chair akin to one in a dentist's office, and a podium behind it, upon which was a device. Before I could get a better look, the man pushed me into the chair. Restraints automatically wrapped around my wrists and ankles. What the heck is this? I tried to break free, but it was of no use. Calm down. You only make things worse for yourself. It's best if you don't struggle. Not much point in it anyhow. Another individual entered the room. A younger gentleman. Henry, where in God's name have you been? Quick, come man the controls. Uh, yes sir, sorry sir. Henry stepped over to the podium and started adjusting things. The older man walked over to me and smiled. He pulled a sharp, silver utensil from his pocket. Don't fight it. It's just a few uh, small incisions, that's all. In a flash, the silver met my forehead. It was over so fast, I barely had time to wince. The man had engraved three straight lines into the skin just below my hairline. There, that wasn't so bad. Henry, are we ready? Yes sir, everything has been calibrated. Good. I chimed in. Why don't you just kill me already? They both laughed. Then the older man leaned in. Do you think that's what we're doing? No, no. We're extracting your soul. But first, we need access to your memories. The powerful ones. The recollections that have stuck with you even after long bouts of time had passed. I felt Henry place a helmet on me. It shrunk to match the outline of my head. The man gave it a few knocks. This here will show us what we need to see. And then the pathway should illuminate. A roadmap to the human soul. That's what we need. Fire it up, Henry. Small prickly needles pierced the cuts on my forehead from within the helmet. And then an image appeared on the black wall ahead. Like a projection almost. It was a memory. One of my memories. As I watched, awestruck, something happened. My consciousness was seamlessly transferred. 
In an instant, I was transported to the scene, now reliving the moment on the wall. Rebecca and I stared at the farmhouse. It wasn't much to look at, but it had potential. That and the land around it was vast, surrounded by a beautiful forest. Is it everything you hoped it would be? Rebecca asked, wrapping her arms around me. It is, actually. I put my arms around her waist and turned to meet her gaze. We had been together only a year, but I knew. Before this point, I truly cared for her, but in this moment, I fell. Now that we were starting a life together, all bets were off. She was the one, and I couldn't have been happier. I awoke in the black room like a diver coming up for air. My lungs were on fire. Reliving memories was not a painless procedure. No, Henry, what have I told you a thousand times before? Happy memories won't do. They're not powerful enough. Find me something dreadful, and do it fast before he's a goner. Goner? I asked. The receptionist entered and handed the man a cup. A beverage I can only guess was their equivalent to coffee. Thank you, Mildred. Lord knows I need it. She laughed. Henry fiddled around at the helm and charted course for a different moment in my sordid past. In an instant, I was transported there. This was one memory I tried so desperately to forget. It was dark, right around midnight. I woke up to an empty rest of the bed. I assumed Rebecca had gone to the bathroom. I can't explain it, but as I waited for her return, something felt wrong. The kind of feeling when you enter a room and a picture frame is slightly askew. You can tell something's amiss, but can never quite put your finger on what. I laid there for a long while and let the unrest consume me. It was only then that I decided to get out of bed and see if Rebecca was alright. Something drew my attention to the window. A figure in the clearing behind the house. I stepped over to the glass for a better look and I saw it. It was Rebecca falling to the ground. My heart sank. I raced out of the house, screaming her name. And when I reached her, I knelt to the ground by her side. She was covered in blood, holding a kitchen knife. She cried and spoke with what little energy she had left. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I had to. The voices, they wouldn't stop. They had to make them stop. I... Her voice trailed off. The life left her eyes. She was gone. Once again, I sprang to life in that godforsaken black room left to reflect on my past. Rebecca was mentally ill. She was seeing a psychologist, but unbeknownst to me, she had stopped taking her medicine. I had no idea that her condition would get that bad. I had no idea that she would even think of taking her own life. And of course, it was all my fault. I should have seen the warning signs. I should have sought better counsel. I should have gotten out of bed sooner. That's why the nightmare started, I thought. It always took place in that dang field. The wood in the ocean, the same shade as the blood that spilled from her veins. I thought it was a manifestation of my own guilt. She was the door, and that's why I felt the need to come to it. But I knew, just as I had that night, that something was amiss. Something that kept me scared of it. My introspection was interrupted by the older gentleman. Manry, that's it. A perfect memory if there ever was one. Keep going, we need another. Just one more should do it. Look for... The sound of liquid emitting something electrical filled my ear. Sparks flew into my peripheral vision. The man had spilled his drink on the controls. Dear God... I heard Henry say. Henry, how could you let this happen? Me? It was then that a new image appeared on the wall, and I was once again transported to another place. This time, I didn't know what to expect. 
I was drowning. Drowning in the ocean of red that played my nightmares. And there, at the center of the field, was the door. In all of its ominous glory. I tried to swim, but the currents were far too fierce. Whilst treading water, the door opened. My wife Rebecca was within. She spread her arms and the waves followed. The sea parted before me and I landed on the ground below, coughing the contents of my lungs out onto the field. I turned to see her stepping past the threshold of the doorway. She walked out into the field, walls of red water on either side of her. Eventually, she stopped where I was and looked out at me. She was beautiful, just as beautiful as the day we met. Hello, my love. I tried to respond, but there was still water in my throat. One blink and she was gone. Her voice met my ear from behind. Why, Why didn't, didn't you, you save, save me? me? I turned and saw her, now bloodied. It was the same state she was in when I found her in the field. Was I not, not good, good enough? enough? Did you Did want you me to, want die? to die? I finished clearing my airways and stood, tears rolling down my cheeks. I'm sorry, Rebecca. I didn't know. I... She interjected. That's not That's good, not enough. good enough. enough. She vanished again. I turned around, and she was there, now clean, holding an infant in her arms. Isn't she Isn't beautiful? She beautiful? Her name's Her name Abigail. Abigail. I trembled. We never had a child, Rebecca. You're right, hon. This is the baby I would have birthed had I lived long enough to have her. Don't you remember picking out the names? Jack for a boy, after his father, and Abigail for a girl. I remembered. We laid in the field for hours one night, looking up at the full moon and discussing where our life together was headed. At one point, we talked about children. Rebecca wanted three, but I insisted on no more than two. One boy and one girl. Jack and Abigail. We mapped out their childhoods and pictured every moment. There would inevitably be some tough times, but we agreed it would all be worth it. I remember Rebecca. She walked over to me and handed me the baby. I looked into its eyes. She was perfect. It's hard to say how I knew, but it was her. The same Abigail we had pictured years ago. You should have saved me, Jack. Now, they'll never exist. A harsh wind came from the forest. I watched in horror as Abigail's form turned to dust and blew away through the gaps between my fingers. I had only known her for a moment, but still, I cried. My little girl, gone. Why are you doing this? I pleaded. Her face was now tinged with anger. You deserve to feel the same regret I felt. I plunged the blade into my skin, but you could have stopped it. I needed you in that field, and you weren't there. And with that, the floodgates opened. A dam of tears burst and streamed down my sides. So did the blood water around us. It towered overhead for a brief period before crashing into me. Once above the waves, I watched as Rebecca walked across the water and into that red door. She looked back and offered me one last sentiment. Goodbye, Jack. The torment was over, but it had taken its toll. I let myself sink to the depths of the ocean. It would be my final resting place. After everything that had been dredged up, I truly wanted to die. I kept wavering in and out of consciousness. I could hear Henry and the man arguing. He's not doing so well in there. We may have to cut this one loose. We can't afford the backlash if this gets out. Pull yourself together, Henry. If we can just get one more good one. That was the last thing I heard before passing out. For a time, I drifted through the black void of a dreamless slumber, until finally something pulled me out. Rebecca's voice. A thunderous cadence that would have woken even a bear from hibernation. Wake up, Wake Jack! Up, Jack. 
I awoke in a white room, the kind of which I recognized. It was a hospital. It seemed that I was being looked after. A nurse was checking my vitals when she looked over and noticed my open eyes. Oh gosh, you're awake. Brilliant. You've been out for quite some time. What happened? I asked in a groggy slur of speech. You were found in a field behind your home, out cold. You've been comatose for nearly 24 hours. I tried pulling myself up into a sitting position. She pushed my shoulders back down. Please, rest. You've lost a lot of electrolytes. I'll go get the doctor. She'll help. Sit tight. The nurse left and I gathered some composure. Comatose, huh? It does the body wonders. Strange nightmares, repressed memories, the works. I let out a morbid laugh, amazed that my brain could even construct such a dream worlds. Within moments, the doctor came in and greeted me. She explained my battered state and advised me to stay for observation over the next few days. I agreed. She went over the finer points of my treatment, but then took a detour to ask me a question. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. What happened to your head? My head, I asked, unsure of what she was referring to. It was then that I noticed the faint brush of gauze against my scalp. Here, take a look. She handed me a mirror and carefully removed the bandage. I was mortified by the sight. Above my eyes were three perfectly straight cuts, etched across my skin.